The Bible describes a group of warriors, Israelite warriors, who defeated Nephilim giants one-on-one -on -one in combat. Where did they get the power, the supernatural power to defeat the giants? How did it happen? You're going to find out tonight and much, much more on the season two premiere of Thursday Night Theology, which starts right now. Welcome to season two, our premiere of Thursday Night Theology. I'm your host, Ryan Peterson. And for those who are new, um, first of all, welcome back to our season one family. But as we get started in the new season, this is the show that, as I always say, is about you. It's about a time for me to answer your questions on Bible prophecy, on anything supernatural, paranormal, complex in the Bible. I want to apply my research uh, for you. And we have some great questions tonight. We have three great questions. And so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, for those, again, just to go over kind of the order of events, um, we have three questions tonight. The first is going to really look at the passages in the life of King David that deal with his mighty men. And these were these elite soldiers that when we look at scripture, I believe, you know, how are they able to fight Nephilim giants one-on-one -on -one and defeat them. I believe that was supernaturally, they were supernaturally endowed with power. And I think that the Bible shows that. So we're going to take a look at that. We're also going to look in our second question at the star of David, this symbol that's obviously well known. It's on the flag of Israel, but what are the origins of it? And is it connected to a star that's mentioned in the book of Amos, the star of Remphan. So we're going to take a look at that. And I think it's going to be very interesting. A lot we're going to see there. And uh, should time permit, we're going to look at one question, an interesting account in Matthew chapter eight and the demons called Legion who were cast into swine, into pigs. Why did they want it that? Why did they request that? What was the, what was the benefit to them in that passage for the demons to go into swine rather than another fate. So we're going to look into that and take your questions as well and do live Q&A tonight. And we're also going to have winners. We're going to pick three winners to get prize packs tonight as well. So it's going to be a fun-filled night. And so you know, I'm going to do the live Q&A tonight. After each question, I'll take one to two questions of live Q&A. So also, it's a great time for fellowship. So drop your comments, let people know where you're from, to share your own ideas, your own theories on the Bible. We are, we're all learning together and growing in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, our Savior. So yeah, so drop that in. And also, if you have questions, again, I want to make sure I get to everyone as, you know, whether you're here early or late. So after each question, I'll do probably one to two live Q&A questions before moving on to our next uh, scheduled question. So let's jump in. And also, I see some likes already and hearts in the room. Definitely drop likes. And if you haven't already subscribed and hit the notif notification bell, do that as well. But let's look at our first question of the night. And this is from Chris Fox. And he writes, greetings, Brother Ryan. Congratulations on Thursday Night Theology Season 2. Thank you very much. Were David's mighty men, the 3 and 30 or 33, uh, specifically empowered to combat the Nephilim? Great question. And so as I already said in the lead, I do think that, you know, this is, I love this question because this is something where, again, it's one of those passages that you don't often hear taught or preached. Now, I actually have heard many sermons on David's mighty men and how they stood by him. They were loyal to him. They were loyal to God, to Yahweh, which is wonderful and very true. And that's all biblical fact. However, I rarely, if ever, hear the, the you know anything, any teaching or sermon on the fact that they were performing superhuman, supernatural feats all throughout these five or six chapters in the long account of the life of King David and his reign. And so we're going to look at some of these, some of these passages. And I think what we're going to see is that they literally had supernatural powers, I believe given by God. And I believe there's a reason for that, why these men in particular were chosen. And I think the Bible demonstrates all of this. So 
let's get to it and start looking at who were these mighty men and what were they doing in, in combat. Okay, so our first passage here, we're going to look at 2 Samuel chapter 10. And this is going to give us our first biblical clue that there's something supernatural at play here. And so we read in verses 6 and 7, it says, And when the children of Ammon saw that they stank before David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of beth and the Syrians of Zobah, 20,000 footmen, and of King Makkah, 1,000 men, and of Ishtab, 12,000 men. And when David heard of it, he sent Joab and all the host of the mighty men. And you see here, I put that and I highlighted to show that his mighty men, these are again, his kind of special ops forces. It uses the word there in Hebrew, gibberim. Gibberim in Hebrew is a term that's repeatedly used in the Old Testament to refer to warriors or beings who have superhuman strength, superhuman abilities. We think of Nimrod, right? So, of course, the, the builder of the Tower of Babel, it says in Scripture that he was a gibberim. And the Septuagint also compares him and says he was a giant. He was a giant hunter before the Lord. And I gave another example here from Genesis 6, verse 4, right? The introduction of the Nephilim, the offspring of the fallen angels and, and the, the daughters of men in Scripture. And it says here... Of course, that there were giants in those days and, all, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. Of course, this is talking about the birth, the conception of the Nephilim. And it says, and they bear children to them. The same became mighty men. This is talking about the giants, the Nephilim, and calls them Gibberim, which are of old men of renown. So right away, we see that the Bible is saying that there is something about David's soldiers, his this special group of 33 soldiers that put them on par in terms of their ability to wage war with the Nephilim themselves and even exceed them. And that's what we're really going to see because then we get, we're going to look now at the accounts of how they get into individual combat and are, you know, whether you want to compare it to pick your soldier of fortune, Rambo, Commando, they're taking on entire armies and taking on the giants single-handedly. And so let's look at some examples. Okay, so here's 1 Chronicles 11, and this really kind of goes through it. And so first we're going to see that it says that the three of the 30 captains of the mighty men, that they were, uh, this is when David was hiding out in the cave of Adullam. And it says the host, the Philistine armies were encamped in the valley of the Rephaim. So right here we already see that they are in Nephilim territory, in the territory of the Nephilim giants. And it says in David was with his, was with the garrison. David was then in the hold, and the Philistine garrison was then at Bethlehem. And here we see David's thirsty. And the first example we see of the exploits of the mighty men is that it says three, just just three of them broke through the host of the Philistines to get water from Bethlehem. They were able to infiltrate past the entire Philistine army just to get water for David, which he actually didn't drink. He poured it out as an offering. But when we get to the bottom here in verse 20, we see this is where I want to focus on because we see the introduction of the first of the mighty men. And his name is Abishai. And it says, Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was chief of the three. And these are the three main leaders of the mighty men. It says, for lifting up his spear against 300, he slew them. So again, right away, we're seeing that 300 Philistine soldiers came to fight him and with a spear, he was able to, to defeat all of them. So I think, again, in these little details, the Bible is showing us that there's something significantly supernatural at play. But uh, let's continue. Just continuing right here in chapter 11 of First Chronicles. And it says, you know, we're going to skip ahead. We see to the next name you see here, which is Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. And it says the son of a valiant man of Calzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And now this passage here is very controversial. The lion-like men of Moab, right? So, you know, what, what, why is that description there? Like, what does that even mean? And so some, you know, were these hybrid beings or were they just men who had, you know, the heart and courage that they were lion-like? And so I lean towards the former. And I think there are a couple of reasons why 
um, we can think we can we can interpret this as be saying these lion like men of Moab were something more than just regular Philistine soldiers. The first is the Hebrew there. And if you look, I put the Hebrew there is Ariel, which can mean a lion of God or the heart of God. And, you know, just the simple fact that they have El, which in Hebrew is the name for God, Elohim, is an indication, I think, of something supernatural at play. And if you also notice, the scripture then goes on to give in the very next sentence the detail that he fought two lion-like men of Moab, but then he also slew an actual lion in a pit. So it's showing that this, again, he fought a lion single-handedly and defeated it. And then the last clue I think we can look to is in the Septuagint, which uh, for those who don't know it, the Septuagint is the oldest existing or extant version of the Old Testament, translated from the Paleo-Hebrew into Greek in about 200 BC. And so it's the oldest existing version of the Old Testament we have. And in this same passage, it calls these men of Moab, the lion-like men, it calls them heroes. And so when you think about the Greek, the original meaning of the word he hero in, you know, from ancient Greek, and especially when you think of Greek mythology, the heroes were a class of beings that were part divine. They had divine ancestry. They were some either the grandchild or somehow an offspring in the lineage of the gods, who, of course, in Greek mythology, were repeatedly marrying and having children with human women. Why? Why is that? Because, again, of course, ancient Greek mythology, and I get into this extensively in Judgment of the Nephilim, uh, it's all just a retelling of the days of Noah and the account of all the birth of the Nephilim and everything that led to the flood judgment. So that's, I think, so I think, again, when we look at what he's doing here and these line like men, I think it's saying again that he performed supernatural combat. He had supernatural ability. And then it just continues and says, and he slew in the next highlighted section, right in the middle of the paragraph, it says, and he slew an Egyptian a man of great stature, five cubits high. Now think, you know, the Egyptian cubit was anywhere from 18 to 20 inches. So this, so this Egyptian giant was roughly eight feet in change. And it says, and in the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to the hill and he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and, and had the name among the three mighties. And so, again, that's First Chronicles 11, 21 to 24. So not only did he confront this Nephilim, and if you think, like, right, think back to just when David was young fighting Goliath, right? Goliath shows up, has on about 200 pounds of armor. He's clearly a descendant of the original Nephilim, and no one in the Israelite army would even come out to fight him. You know, he wanted to fight someone one-on-one. -on -one. Even Saul, King Saul, who was king at the time, who we, we know from Scripture says Saul was a head taller than every person in the nation of Israel, and he wouldn't even come out. And of course, we know David fought him and defeated him uh, through God's power, of course. And here we have one of the mighty men just going directly at this giant, this Egyptian giant, taking his own spear and killing him with it. So again, another supernatural exports, exploit. So I think it's showing again, biblically, that these men were not normal. They were given divinely endowed superhuman strength and powers and prowess. We'll look at a couple more examples, then we're going to get into why and how this happened. So let's, let's uh, continue here. So here we see the introduction of yet another giant, and we're going to skip right to where David's here. He's David was weak. He says he's waxing faint. He was weak from the battle with the Philistines and says, Ishbi Banab, who, of course, is a giant, which was of the sons of the giant. It says the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight. And if you think back to Goliath, it says his, you know, his spear was 600 shekels. So it means it just means the spearhead was basically about eight to nine pounds, which is a very heavy tip of a spear. So his spear was huge. And it says he being girded with the new sword thought to have slain David. But again, we see here Abishai to the rescue again, but Abishai the son of Zariah um, basically comforted him and smote the Philistine and killed him. So he kills Ishbibanab. And it says, Then uh, the men of David swore unto him, saying, Thou shalt not go out more, uh, 
no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gab, at, at Gab Gob. Then Sibekai, the Hushethite, slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. And you see there again that term, Rephaim. And again, what I explain in my writings is that the Rephaim, that was the original, if you want to call it ethnic classification of all of the giants before the flood. And so um, when we see the different names in scripture, particularly in Genesis 14, where they're introduced as the Zanzamim, the Emims, and many different types of names and ethnicities, it was because of the Tower of Babel dispersions, the different languages that the various cultures, the nations that were created after God dispersed the nations at the Tower of Babel and confused the languages. They just gave their own name to the giants. And so that's where it comes from. But they were all originally Raphaim. So these were clearly descendants of the original hybrids. Let's look at one last. This is this is. Uh, OK, let's see here. Oh, yeah, that's that's um, all right, I think we looked at enough here. Let's see what we got here. All right. So why? Now we're going to get into why. Why were they able to pull off all of these exploits, right? And so, you know, I think it's an important reason. And it's because of the character of King David. I believe David fulfilled a promise that was made to Israel centuries earlier. A supernatural promise. And I think that's why David and his mighty men were able to conquer and defeat the Nephilim giants. So we're going to dig back into the text and, and, and find out what do the scriptures reveal about this. So let's see what I got here. So here's one last, I just wanted to point this one out because we see another battle in, in Gath where it says that this giant had six fingers on every, on six fingers on every foot, six toes. So he had, you know, 24 digits and he was also slain. So clearly we're talking about supernatural beings, but I want to go to a quick passage, something we know really well which is this idea that, of course, it says that David, what distinguished him was that God said when he basically took his blessing and anointing of Saul as king and said he was going to choose David, he said he sought a man after his own heart. And this is a very popular descriptor about King David. We hear this about him all the time. You hear this in church all the time. But I want to just clarify biblically what I believe that means is that it wasn't just that he was a great person or a... Uh, a very righteous person. And, and I've, in fact, many people use this passage to say, to kind of try to justify the horrible things David did, right? He took Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. He then had Uriah set up to die. So he, he uh, definitely did bad things and was punished for it, right? He lost his child for it. But it's, I don't think it's really talking about that. What I think the scripture is saying in terms of why he was a man after God's own heart was his absolute loyalty and faithfulness to following Yahweh. You know, when you look at David compared to most of the kings of Israel, right, whether we're talking about the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, including Solomon, his own son, there was rampant idolatry with just a handful of exceptions. But David was that was never even remotely an issue. And he also observed God's commandments. The easiest example of this was looking at King Saul. King Saul, who, of course, was jealous of David, wanted to kill David, was repeatedly plotting against him. And when David had found Saul sleeping and had a chance to kill him and get revenge on this insane, evil king who was trying to murder him, he didn't do it. And why? Because he said he wasn't going to harm Saul, because Saul was anointed and chosen by God to be king. So even if Saul was being deposed by God, David was, was going to say, I'm going to let God handle it. And then think about the Ark of the Covenant, how David was so passionate and zealous and anxious to get the Ark to Jerusalem, to bring it in. He was dancing. Everything he wanted to do was to make sure he was fulfilling God's commandments. And that, that goes back to a promise that God actually made to the Israelites in the days of Moses to promise them supernatural power. So where can we find that? Because that's actually in the scriptures. It's in Leviticus chapter 26. So let's take a look. Let's see what we have here. Okay, this is about David. I'm going to go ahead to uh, Leviticus 26. Here we go. So here are God's commands, right? So God's giving the commands to Israel. It says, and notice what it starts with. You shall make you no idols nor graven images. 
neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up an image of stone in your hand. So this is all about idolatry. God starting his commandments with do not worship other gods like the 10 commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And notice, notice the highlight, the second highlighted section. If ye walk in my statutes, even keep my commandments and do them. And here's where God gives his promises. He offers them good harvest, yield, fruits, crops. But let's continue because this is just up to verse five in Leviticus 26. So we have all these, uh, there'll be great food. There'll be abundance of harvest. But as it continues, we get to a, a, the supernatural promise. And here in verses six to nine, it says, And I will give peace in the land, and ye shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will rid evil beasts out of the land, neither shall the sword go through your land. And ye shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. And this is where we're getting to it. And five of you shall chase a hundred. And a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. So here God is clearly saying, if you walk with me, if you stay faithful to me, especially as the king, the king was the spiritual leader of the nation. As he went, the nation went in terms of whether they're going to be faithful and worship the true and living God, Yahweh only, or fall to the fallen angels and the Nephilim giants and worship them instead. And so the promise was God's going to give you supernatural powers to fight your enemies. He says, you know, five of you will be able to take on a hundred, a hundred will take on 10,000. And this was the promise that David fulfilled, right? God isn't just throwing this out. This isn't just poetic language. This is a literal covenant that God is making. And we see more examples of this. Let's take a look at another example here. Okay, so this is from the Jameson Fawcett Commentary, actually, in 1868. And this 19th century commentary, it's a great commentary. Look what it says. It says, the promise given to Israel on condition of religious allegiance to God that five of people should, by his, meaning God's miraculous aid, chase a hundred of their enemies, in quotes Leviticus 26. And so, again, it's saying that this was God's promise, that they can have supernatural victory in battle. And I believe because David was so faithful and his mighty men faithful to him, right? They called him the light of Israel. They understood his role in God's plan. God gave them superhuman and supernatural powers to even take on the Nephilim giants. And so we'll look at a couple other examples here of where we see this in scripture, right? Of course, we have the example of Samson, and this is Judges 15, 14 to 15, and it says, you know, of course, the Philistines shouted against him at, Le at Lehi and it says, and the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. He was tied up and it says the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire and his hands tossed from off his and, and his bond, his bands tossed from off his hands. He breaks out of the bonds he was in and he found a new jawbone of a donkey of an ass and put forth his hands and took it and slew a thousand men therewith, right? Samson was able to kill a thousand Philistines with a bone, a jawbone of a donkey. And then, of course, we have Joshua, who we never mentioned, right? He, he doesn't get enough respect for being, he was the ultimate giant slayer in the book of Joshua. And look what God says to him. We'll go back to that in Joshua 23. It says, one man of you shall chase a thousand. For the Lord your God, he is that fighteth for you as he hath promised you. See, again, the promise of God. And of course, we look at Joshua, Joshua, who's a true type of Yeshua, of Jesus, leading the Israelites into the promised land, conquering the enemy to lead Israel into, into the land of Canaan, right? And so just a total type and beautiful foreshadow of the work of Jesus Christ, who wins and has won our promised land, right? Eternity, salvation, heaven, the new earth, the new heaven. He's won it all for us. Joshua was faithful. His eye was single. He was constantly on mission throughout the entire book of Joshua. He never wavered. And so, of course, God gave him that supernatural ability. So that is my answer to question number one. And I think it's very clear that, and we see even, there are even more examples about this phrase where God gives that promise of chasing a thousand uh, with just a handful of warriors if, if Israel is just loyal to him. So I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And think about that in your own life, in your own battles, right? God wants to go before you and he's 
made the covenant, right? When we are faithful and we seek him, he can win our own battles that we have in life. Whatever those battles are, may not be a physical enemy. It could be a spiritual enemy. It could be uh, anxiety, depression, struggles in school, whatever it is, let God go before you and fight your battles. So that's my answer to question number one. And we're going to do, before we go to a break, I'm going to look and do a little live Q&A and let's see uh, some questions we can get at. Okay, we have our first question here. Question, why do you think the Nephilim are allowed to continue after the flood? Great question. I get this question all the time. So I'm so happy to answer this question because I get it probably on a weekly basis. And I welcome that. And by the way, if you are watching this on replay and you want your questions answered for a future episode, put it in the comments, whatever you're watching it. I always go back to the videos to get comments and questions for future episodes of Thursday Night Theology. So great question. And why? So I think, again, we have to understand that God has a certain limit when it comes to sin. God will allow certain things to take place and continue, right? The easy example you can think of is Satan, right? The original, God, Jesus said that the devil was a murderer from the beginning, and yet he's still roaming to and fro on the earth, right? The devil is not in hell. I don't, and I don't believe the devil has actually ever been in hell. He's going to and fro on the earth. He still has access to heaven. We see this in the book of Job in chapters one and two. He can speak to God. In Revelation 12, he, he's specifically called the accuser of the brethren. Who That's what he's actually doing in heaven, accusing you and me and all who believe in our Savior, Jesus. Um, but yet God's allowing it, right? We see it also when God speaks to Abraham in the book of Genesis, and he talks about the Amalekites. And he says he's not going to judge them yet because he's, he's still waiting because their sin basically hasn't come to the full. So God allows, you know, and, and he does the same thing with us, by the way, right? Look at Lamentations chapter three. It's because it's, it's because of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed, right? I sin every day and yet God allows me to breathe another morning. I'm very grateful. It's his mercy that we're not consumed. So he does this with all of us, right? So we shouldn't put ourselves above anybody. But and so when it, so now let's apply it to Genesis six. When we look at the Nephilim coming, you know, through uh, the flood, which I believe happened genetically, I believe the genes passed through on the ark in the wives of Noah's sons, right? Because the testimony of Genesis 6, first of all, is that by the time Noah was even having children, three times God himself, Yahweh says all flesh had corrupted itself. So the odds of finding three women for his sons when they reached adulthood um, who had no trace of Nephilim DNA was slim to none. Then you look at um, what happens with the wars in the book of Joshua. I believe God allowed it to continue to serve as a testimony of his might and his power. And he says this in the book of Joshua, that he uses the giants as a testimony of his power, that he is Yahweh. That the supernatural victories were a testimony to him being the God, the Most High, El Elyon, right? And when you think about the demons, um, I mentioned this in Judgment of the Nephilim, that I have a chapter called Jesus Christ uh, and the Nephilim that talks about the demons in the Gospels, right? There are demons all over the place during the ministry of Christ. And they, of course, are the spirits of the dead Nephilim. And every time Jesus cast them out, it served as a proof that he was the Messiah. So he, even in, in death, in their spirit form, the Nephilim were still used as a tool by God to demonstrate that he is the true God and that Yeshua was the true Messiah. So great question. Let's see if we can find one more and then we'll take a break and get to question number two, which also deals with demons. Oh, great question from Reynaldo. Do you believe the Nephilim will come back again for the tribulation? <laughs> well, yes, I do, Rinaldo. Absolutely. In fact, not only do I think they will come back, I believe that the the, the final Nephilim who, of the Great Tribulation, I believe, is actually the Antichrist. And we talk about the final Nephilim, my second book. That is the entire thesis of it, right? And how can how can I make such an assertion, right? Well, there's there are several prophecies. The first, again, is Genesis three fifteen, right? The original prophecy of the Messiah. When God told Adam and Eve their punishment, he then told the serpent that he was going to put enmity, war, conflict between her seed, the seed of the woman, 
And we all talk about the seed of the woman is very common in churches today that that is the prophecy of the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, that that was that he is that seed who would bruise or crush the head of the serpent. But there were two seeds mentioned in that prophecy. And that's where I start the final Nephilim that we have to we have to reconcile that. Right. God says he says her seed and your seed speaking to the devil. And I believe the devil is going to have his own seed who, of course, is the Antichrist. And I believe he's going to be a literal hybrid, a half fallen angel, right? The devil being a fallen angel and half human. And I think it's very important, actually, you know, and this is something Timothy Alberino uh, really, uh, I think, does a great job explaining in his book, Birthright, that idea that the importance of the Antichrist being a hybrid, that he has to be part human, to rule over humanity. And so he's going to be a hybrid and an imitation of Christ, right? The false Messiah. And yes, I believe he'll be a Nephilim. The second thing is, of course, we can look to Daniel chapter two and we see, you know, when we see this, uh, the prophecy, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar, the prophetic dream that Nebuchadnezzar has of the statue with the, the head of gold, torso of silver, midsection of brass and legs of iron and feet of iron and miry clay. And that prophecy, we're told that that kingdom the toes and the feet that are iron and miry clay says that's the final kingdom on earth and it says during that kingdom they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men but they shall not cleave one to another so who is the they right the seed of men is human that's human genetics human dna so the they i believe in that passage is definitely referring to the fallen angels again attempting to recreate the days of Noah. And we see previews of that, right, already with transhumanism, CRISPR, all the things that are happening right now, I think, are the birth pangs to the ultimate attempt to mingle seed by the fallen angelic realm again. So, all right, so two great questions. That was awesome. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll get to question number two. Okay, so that was a uh, ad for the audio version of Judgment on the Nephilim, my first book, which is a comprehensive biblical study of Genesis 6. So if you want more in-depth detail on the Nephilim, what happened in the days of Noah, all the questions, right? How can an angel conceive a child with a human woman? It's all in there, right? Um, all the way up to the birth of Christ, you know, and showing how this really is the story of the Old Testament from Genesis right up to the Gospels. It's in Judgment of the Nephilim. Of course, you can find links to uh, get the book. It's available on my website, judgmentofthenephilim.com, as well as on Amazon and Barnes & Noble now. And you can find the links to all of that in the description of this video. So let's get to our second question. I said our second question was about demons, but actually that's, that's question number three. We're going to get to our second question now. Okay. So this is from map nine, six, seven, one. And he said, yay question. Can you give some insight on Amos five verse 26 and the star of David? Question number two, where can I get a copy of your new book, End Times Nephilim Deception? Thanks so much. I've missed Thursday Night Theology. Well, thank you, Map, and I've missed all of you too. Um, it's so great to be back with all of you. It's awesome. I'm very excited. So and I see lots of familiar faces in the chat. So it's awesome. And so uh, I'll start with question number two. So I do. So End Times Nephilim Deception is actually my new documentary. It is uh, not a book. It's a documentary. I have documentaries as well. And um, 
that deals with it's basically an expose on pop culture and all the movies and books that are talking about the Nephilim. So that is now available on my website on jeffthenephilim.com. And again, you can find the links to that in the description of this video. And it will be um, available for on Vimeo as well um, next week. So for next week's episode, I'll have all the links, the trailer and all that good stuff. But it's a great documentary. It's going to blow your mind. It has so many things that are happening right now books and movies that are targeting our young people, our children, our grandchildren, our adolescents, that the church, even those who are into prophecy, are unaware of. It's mind-blowing how they are taking Genesis 6 and the Nephilim and twisting the whole account to make the Nephilim the heroes, the fallen angels, just angels who just were just in love and trying to do the right thing, and even, even promoting the Antichrist. So much more to come on that. So, But let's get to the main question here, and that's about the Star of David, right? The symbol, of course, that is on the, the six-pointed star that we know is on the flag of Israel and is used actually in many cultures. And the, you know, it's also known as a hexagram. And uh, this passage in Amos chapter 5. So, of course, you know, Thursday Night Theology, the first thing we're going to do is get into Scripture and see what it says about this in the book of Amos. So, let's go. Okay, so this is when... To set the stage, this is when the prophet is rebuking the northern kingdom of Israel for the, uh, for idolatry, right? What King David was so great at avoiding, they were falling into idolatry, worshiping uh, the gods of the ancient world. And in this rebuke, this is what God is saying through the prophet, have you offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years of house of Israel? But you have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which you made to yourselves. You notice these are things they're fashioning. They're making these idols. There's, you know, the statues. And it says, therefore, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. And isn't it interesting that, he, that Yahweh uses the title God of hosts there? Because, of course, the host of heaven is a reference to the angelic realm. So, what is this star, right? When he talks about Chiun and um, and Moloch. Of course, Moloch was another name for the god Baal. But we're going to look at this star and look at another reference to it. And so, um, and so, well, first of all, here's the prohibition that we see that God clearly gave. And so this is really important because God often, the, the language of stars and angels is often used interchangeably in scripture. We think of Revelation chapter 12, where the, the apostle John has this image, this, he's this vision of the dragon, the devil, dragging, says a third of the stars with him down to earth when the Satan is finally evicted from heaven, which is a future event uh, during you know the great tribulation. But the, those stars are angels. And so given that context, we're going to see another example of that here. And so this is Deuteronomy 4.19. And this, again, is God giving the law to the Israelites and warning them against worshiping the fallen angels. And it says, And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven. So there's the term. It's equating this as the host of heaven. Shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, right? These, we're talking about beings, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. So not only is God equating them with the stars, he's also getting into what the divine counsel here, right? This is divine counsel territory where God is explaining here that he has divided the nation, the angels, and assigned them to the nations of the earth. And so, and of course, God shows Israel as his own nation. Of course, this is the late great Dr. Michael Heiser's groundbreaking research on the divine council. He really was the first to really bring this out, that this is a passage that God at the tower of Babel basically gave over the Gentile nations to the fallen angels and kept Israel. He says that it says that, you know, Israel is God's portion. He was going to build his own nation from one man, Abraham. And that would, that's how he would save the world. And so we see just further confirmation of this. Look at this passage. This is really interesting because I'm, I love this because this is the one that's mentioned often. But let's, let's take another look at this passage. This is Deuteronomy 29. And look what we read here. This is, and this is from the Septuagint. And this is verses 23 to 25. And it says, and this is again is a rebuke. God's saying that if Israel falls into sin, 
all the nations will say, why has the Lord done this to the land? I mean, in other words, why is he judging his people? What is this great fierceness of anger? And men shall say, because they forsook the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, the things which he appointed to their fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they went and served other gods, right? Other gods. Now we're talking about the fallen angelic realm, which they knew not. Neither did he, meaning Yahweh, assign them to them. So this passage is again confirming that the angels, there's an order of angels who are assigned to the nations of the world. And I believe Israel's angel is Michael, right? We're told in the book of Daniel, Daniel's told explicitly, he says, Michael, your prince, the prince of Israel, of course, is a righteous archangel, but all the other nations of the world had angels assigned to them and the fallen angels. And this is, of course, a part of the whole divine council uh, theology that Michael Heiser's brought out. So, but, what we, but the point here, getting back to the Star of David, is we see this connection between stars and the fallen angels and false gods, the idols. And so this is what, you know, so when we think about the star, the star of David, we have to get in question, where did that come from? Because there is no star of David in scripture, right? So where did, what is the significance of this hexagram and where does it come from? Well, we're going to look into that. And so, but first I want to make sure I give the explanation of the Star of David as it's commonly understood with respect to the Israeli flag. And this is from Britannica.com. I just put the whole definition in here. I won't read the whole definition, but it says this symbol, the Star of David, which historically was not limited to use by Jews. Notice it did not originate with the nation of Israel. It originated in antiquity when side by side with the five pointed star, it served as a magical sign or as a decoration. The term Magen David, which in Jewish liturgy signifies God as the shield of David, and Magen David just means shield of David, gained currency among medieval Jewish mystics who attached magical powers to King David's shield just as earlier non-Jewish magical traditions had and referred to the, the five-pointed star as the seal of Solomon. Then it goes on to talk about Kabbalists popularized the use of it as well as a protection against evil spirits. And it closes by saying that there is no biblical authority for it. So even, even the secular Encyclopedia Britannica understands that there, it's not in the Bible. At no point was there ever a star of David symbol or given to the nation of Israel or, be, or told to be put on a flag. But we see that it didn't even originate with Israel. And, it's, and when it was used in basically medieval times, it was for magic, right? It was more connected to the Kabbalah and to magic, which of course in the scripture is seeking the supernatural realm outside of Yahweh. So not a great origin. And it gets even deeper. And so, because we see it's a very revered and very powerful symbol when you look into the occult and to Freemasonry and spiritualism, we see that it really has great significance to those practitioners. And so we're going to look here. And this is just from the Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. And it says, the double triangle of Solomon is the sign of the macrocosmos, which is the great world. It has many meanings in the lesser and greater mysteries. It is the three who bear record in heaven and the three who give testimony on earth. It is the sign of the eternal creator, the grand architect, who of course is gods to the Freemasons. It is that also of the triune man, perfect in the archetyped world as a prototypical image in the divine mind. So what is this saying? It's really saying that it's a key, right? Freemasonry is all about ascending to levels of godhood, right? That's basically what it's saying. That's the key is somehow unlocking uh, basically divine power. And again, this whole idea of trying to reach godhood outside of God, of, outside of actually worshiping and believing in Yahweh. And isn't it amazing how that kind of follows with our first question, right? The what gave David supernatural power was absolute loyalty to God and God alone. And here we see the consequences of not doing that. It leads you down a very dark path. And so so yeah, so that so that so so this is really a very powerful occult symbol, and we'll look at another example here. And so this is from a New Age site. I didn't cite it on purpose, but I can assure you it's from a New Age website. And we see here the uh, flag, obviously, of Israel, and then the that engraving you see is is over the entrance to a, a Freemasonic lodge. And it says from the website, there's a lot of symbolism packed into that explanation. 
the uh, macro prosopos and micro prosopos translate to the creator of the greater world and creator of the little world. The symbol is also frequently equated to the hermetic maxim as above, so below. That is to say things that happen in the spiritual realm in the microcosm reflect throughout the physical realm and the microcosm or macrocosm. And so where's this all coming from, right? This as above, so below, the symbolism. A lot of this came from that. And that drawing I showed originally here, I'll show it again real quickly. I'm sorry, here. This is a colored version of the original drawing of uh, by Eliphas Levy, who was a Luciferian occultist, a revered occultist and Luciferian. And he made this symbol and to symbolize all these things, you know, acquiring the divine mind access to the divine realm, right? It goes right back to the Garden of Eden, right? The devil telling Eve that if you eat of the fruit, ye shall be as gods. Your eyes shall be open, achieving this knowledge, right? Knowing good and evil. And so, again, very disturbing history. And so, I'm not a proponent, you know, you know, and, and, and let's not just call it Israel, right? Let's not forget, right? We have stars, there are 50 stars in the American flag. But, you know, isn't it interesting how often we use stars as symbolism for countries, for nations, for things that are special, even celebrities, we call them stars. Why is that, right? What is inspiring even that idea, right? I think it all goes back to this idea of what God told us not to do, not to worship the stars, not to look to them, not to bow down before them. And so, so yeah, so I, so I think ultimately, I think that the origin of it is not biblical. So I think it's to answer the question, I don't think it's biblical. I don't know if it's the st- actually the star of Remphan or Chiun in the, in the New Testament in Acts 7, Stephen calls it Remphan, which is another name for Saturn in ancient times. So, but however, it doesn't have, its origins are definitely in the occult and other religions. Even Hinduism has used the pentagram for thousands, I'm sorry, the hexagram for thousands of years. And just in case you didn't think people just in popular society are aware of this, I'm going to show one last image here. Again, this is the original drawing by Eliphas Levi, again, who was an open Luciferian. And here's his drawing, and look to the right. This is an ad, and for those who don't know, that is the pop singer there, Britney Spears, and it's an ad for her perfume. And notice the similarity, right? The 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 the, the crossing of the black and white, the, the opposite colors, as above, so below, the fusion of opposites. And what does this really come back to? I believe it comes back to Genesis 6, sons of God, daughters of men, right? The sons of God coming from heaven to the doors of men and creating the Superman, the Ubermensch, as the, as, as, uh, you know, the Germany, the German, the Third Reich called it, the, the, the Nephilim and the hybrid. And so, again, that's an ad. And I'm sure 99% of the people who saw that had no idea what that, that was, what they were even referencing. And maybe Britney Spears wasn't even aware herself but it's there in that ad. So believe me, it's out there. So this is why, you know, what does the Ephesians tell us in the book, in the chapter five, right? That we should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but reprove them, expose them. So thank you for this question. Cause it gave a chance just to expose the history behind the hexagram. And it's, I definitely wouldn't recommend putting it over your door in a circle with a snake around it. So that is my question. And I answered the question number two. And uh, again, I think we're going to keep it rolling with a little live Q&A. And so let's see if we can get one or two questions going uh, for a live answer. This is a great question. Uh, Will AI be part of the Nephilim? Well, I do think, um, I do believe AI will be part of the Great Tribulation. And how is that, right? I think the easiest example, when we're talking about artificial intelligence, that to me is like, absolutely mind-blowing is when we look at the image of the beast. Now, of course, in Revelation 13, we're told about the Antichrist who's going to rule over the world, be received as the Messiah of the world for three and a half years, like literally ruling in a global government. And, and But he also will have a global religion, right? You will have to worship the Antichrist or die, right? Under penalty of death. And, but the interesting thing is that the Antichrist doesn't receive that worship directly. The false prophet, who is basically kind of his right hand man, slash religious leader, slash prime minister, whatever you want, you know, his chief disciple, uh, essentially, he says he causes the world, the people of the world who follow him, who follow the Antichrist, 
to create an image, right? And this all, again, is what I call a quantum repetition. In the final Nephilim, I, I go into detail about how the Bible repeats events. And you think back to Moses and Aaron and the golden calf, how Aaron caused the people to give all their gold and make an idol. This is exactly, to be worshipped, this is exactly what the false prophet's going to do in the Great Tribulation. So they make this image of the beast that they set up in the temple, which I believe is the is going to be the ultimate abomination of desolation. And why does they need this image to be worshipped? And I believe that's because the Antichrist is not omnipotent. He's not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. He's not all-knowing. And he's not omnipresent. He has to go wage wars. He has to lead his government. So he sets up this image to receive his worship every day from all of his followers. And so, but the interesting thing about the image, it says it's an image, it's created, but it says it's given life. It's literally going to be alive. And so that, to me, that is the culmination of artificial intelligence, right? Everything we're seeing now is just a preview. You know, I know there was a story last year about how a Google engineer said that they, they actually had an AI program that kind of self-actualized and they had to shut it off because it was actually becoming fully autonomous. This is that times a thousand because it says not only is it going to be alive, it's going to literally know who is worshiping it and who is not think about that right i'm i'm, I'm actually going to do an episode on that for for uh, a regular video so i should also mention that i'm starting i'm restarting my, my podcast so i'll get into that after our next break but i'm going to do something about artificial intelligence and where i think this is all going like when we look at things like Neuralink, but it's going to know whether or not you're worshiping it for everybody on the earth now how can that be that's powerful ai so that's where i see it all coming together so great great question Let's see if we have time for one more. We're going to go to a break. Okay, Steve Flanders. All right, let's see. It says, hi, Ryan. When God divided the world at the Babel judgment, did he place the regions under members of his divine council or did he give the people over to the false gods they wish to serve? Were the principalities already fallen or did they rebel sometime after being put in authority over the regions of the earth? So yeah, so a uh, so great series of questions. So I'll try and take it out all, like address all of that in one answer. And so I think these angels are actually were already uh, fallen. Um, it is possible they weren't, but I think they were. Because I think God at that point knew he was drawing his line in the sand, right? And, and intentionally, because think about the, the context. The context was the world had just tried to achieve a one world government and one world religion at the Tower of Babel. Think about that. It says that the entire world was gathered to do this construction project. And I believe it wasn't just to build a tower that was high because it says that they, they could reach heaven, right? They wanted to actually usurp God. I think they were trying to open the veil and bring back the fallen angel of Genesis 6, right? This is shortly, this is centuries after the flood. These are the generations who who now hear the rumors from Noah's descendants of the Nephilim and everything that took place in the days of Noah. And so I think that was a really, I think we underestimate how much of an offense that was to God, right? You think about that God literally came down from heaven, which doesn't happen that often in scripture that God comes down from heaven to punish anybody. Um, but he did at Babel. And so I think God had, and then of course he, he confused them, right? He, he created the language to intentionally divide them. So I think when he was assigning those angels, they were already evil because the people themselves that they were going to govern were already evil. And so, um, so that's my thought on that. And so, so I think it was much more, it was a combination of God is saying, I'm going to turn over right? It, right. God will always give you what you want, right? It's like the Israelites and they said, give us a king so we can be like the other nations. God's like, okay. You know, it's, you know, uh, Samuel uh, warned them and said, look, he's going to be horrible to you. He's going to oppress you. He's going to take your children. They said, we don't care. Nevertheless, give us that king. So God will give you what you want. And if you want to keep rebelling and have a false God over you, that's what you receive. So I think that's what happened after the Tower of Babel rebellion. So excellent, excellent question. So we're going to get to a break and then we're going to come back and wrap up with question number three, which is about the demons.
Okay, and that was an ad for the final Nephilim. As I mentioned, it gets into the end times, right? It gets into the Antichrist, the reign of the Antichrist, the purpose of the Antichrist, the return of the angels of Genesis 6, right? Um, it deals with transhumanism, the UFO phenomenon, quantum physics, and much, 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 much more. And ultimately, of course, the conclusion of God's plan to redeem humanity through our savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. So uh, definitely, again, if you were interested, the links to all of these things. And also, I, like I mentioned before, I also have documentaries. I have the Judgment of the Nephilim, Secret to the Pre-Flood World, is the, and the Final Nephilim, Battle for Heaven and Earth, which are basically high-level summaries of both my books, as well as my new my new documentary, End Times Nephilim Deception, all in the links to the description, and, and also study guides as well for both books. So um, I'm very appreciative and thankful for the many people who are now not just reading the books, but studying it either alone or in groups and even churches. So it's awesome. So all that you can find in the links in the description of the video. And um, and you can also like too. So if you want to support this ministry and everything I'm doing here and everything we're doing in the, at Days of No Publishing, drop a like, whether on whatever platform you're, you're watching right now. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe. But enough on that. Let's get to question number three. Okay, this is from Nikki Wolford. It says, you may have already addressed this part of Matthew 8 in some of your material, but I have wondered what benefit the devils gained by requesting and being allowed by Jesus to go into the herd of swine when they were cast out, since the animals were immediately killed. What happened to the devils at that point? Thank you. Great question. And this brings in a lot of interesting, really, really interesting issues. So I really wanted to, I'm, I'm happy to answer this question. And so, of course, we're going to look at what happened in Matthew 8. And to set the stage, of course, this is when Jesus is during his ministry on earth in the Gospels, is traveling through a region of the Gardarenes and encounters uh, men possessed by demons, but not just a demon thousands of demons right they in this and, and even you know i believe even six thousand which is the number of an actual legion at that time which was which is the name they they took on and what took place there you know we see they're, they're going to be cast into animals we're going to dig into what the text reveals about why not they wanted that to happen so let's let's take a look so this is matthew chapter 8 verses 28 to 32 and it says when, when he jesus was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes. There met him two men possessed with demons coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And isn't it already interesting that just as we saw, right, the supernatural superhuman powers go both ways, right? You have the mighty men who had superhuman strength and ability, but now someone possessed by a demon has superhuman strength as well. So... Um, very, very interesting of what's happening in the unseen realm, but let's continue. And it says, and behold, they, now these are the demons speaking through the possessed man say, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before the time. And there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine or pigs feeding, so the devils or demons besought Jesus, saying they were requesting Jesus. They say, if, if, if you cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And Jesus said unto them, go. And when they were come out, meaning coming out of the men they were possessing, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and they perished in the waters. And so very... Uh, fascinating passage of sorry let me just bring this up real quick okay fascinating passage okay so the, the jesus of course is in this conversation with demons and this passage reveals so many different things about what's taking place in, with respect to the, the spiritual realm and our lord right is that it's first of all and i i get into this and explain this in my first book that the demons know who jesus is they see him and immediately say, what do we have to do with you? They're scared of him. Now, why is that? How is that? It's because they, of course, the demons are not fallen angels. And I, uh, I have a whole chapter on this, the difference between a demon and a fallen angel. They're completely different beings. And the demons are the spirits of the dead, deceased Nephilim giants. And I also, in the Old Testament, 
in many of these battles, right? We saw this earlier in question number one, it says the Lord, like God told Joshua in Joshua 23, the Lord will fight for you. That's Jesus. Oftentimes in the battles against the Nephilim in the land of Canaan, it was Jesus actually leading the charge, fighting against the giants and conquering them while the Israelite army came in behind. And so, um, so these demons are now coming face to face with the same angel of the Lord as he was known in the Old Testament who killed them in the first place. And that's why they're deathly afraid of him. They say, have you come to torment us and judge us? But what about these pigs? Why do they want to go into pigs? Well, we, to get the real answer to that, we have to go to the corresponding chapter, which is in Luke chapter 8. So let's get over there and we'll find, I think, some, some revelation. So here's the same exact passage um, being told in the book of Luke in chapter 8. Isn't that interesting how it's the same numbered chapter as well, how God works that out? And again, we see the unclean spirits, and Jesus says, going to the middle of the passage, it says, and Jesus asked him, saying, what is thy name? And he said, legion, because many devils were entered into him. And I mentioned earlier, a Roman legion was 6,000 soldiers. So this could have been thousands of demons inside of him. And they, again, the demons besought Jesus that he would not command them to go into the deep. And this is the abusos. And this is where we get the revelation here, right, of why they wanted to go into the pigs, because they were scared to go into the deep. Now, what's the deep? The abusos in Greek, what that is, that is the bottomless pit. That is hell. But not just, you know, hell biblically uh, has multiple compartments, right? You know, before the resurrection of Christ, the righteous and the wicked went to hell. David said, my soul, you will not let my soul remain in hell. That's King David, right? Who was a man after God's own hearts because he understood that there was a temporary place for the righteous as well, of course, a place of torment for the wicked. But there was a third compartment, the deep, the bottomless pit, the abusos, which was the, the prison of the fallen angels in which fallen angels the angels of Genesis chapter six. And how do we know this? We're told this in the book of Jude explicitly in verses six and seven. It says the angels who, who, who the angels who sinned going after strange flesh for fornication like Sodom and Gomorrah. It says that God has chained them, put them in the abyss in chains under darkness. So the, they are the only fallen angels right now who are actually in hell are the, the fathers of the Nephilim from the days of Noah. They were punished immediately. Like we talked earlier about how Satan is still roaming to and from the earth. The Genesis 6 fallen angels who participated in this sin of fornication with human women and created the hybrids, they were punished immediately. And I believe they were dragged down to the abyss in the floodwaters. And I go into extensive detail about this in Judgment of the Nephilim. Um, and so... So what do the demons know? The demons know this, right? This, these are their parents. So they don't want to go to this place, right? And I, and I think that also shows why I don't believe the angels ever committed this sin again. Is because it had such a chilling deterrent effect. The demons, the abyss must be horrible from the spirit, from the spirit realm being perspective, because they are begging Jesus, do not send us there, right? And so, and of course, and, and Jesus listens to them. And then he sends them into the pigs. And I think even that is giving us a revelation about the judgment of the Nephilim. Because if you think about it, right, one, he's putting them in pigs who are unclean animals uh, in Levitical law, right? So they're, again, outside of God's plan. And like the Nephilim, right, they were outside of God's creation, which is why God had to eliminate them because they were a threat to human genetics. And what do they do? They go and drown immediately. They run into the sea and all drown. So they're reenacting the original judgment of the original Nephilim, which was the flood judgment. They were the reason for the flood. God was cleansing the earth of this genetic contamination and rebooting it through Noah, who of course we're told was Tamim. It says that he was a just man and perfect in his generations. That Tamim referred to his physical perfection, that he was perfectly human. So we see a full reenactment right here in this little passage of the judgment of the Nephilim. And so that is the story here of the swan. And see what else we got here. So um, here's just a passage here. And this is from a 19th century commentary. And, and I, I won't go through the whole thing, but it says, let us pause to examine this text, which is decisive as to where Christ was between his death and resurrection. 
the deep or abyss, abyss is manifestly used by the apostle, meaning the apostle Paul, for Hades, because to bring Christ from the deep is tantamount to his rising again from the dead. Then, since the word abyss is used by the apostle for Hades, the next question is, does it denote the habitation of the righteous or the wicked dead? It was actually both before the, before the cross. That the expression signifies the abode of the lost can be proved beyond all contradiction by quoting one passage from the gospel. And it's quoting Luke 8.31, where we read, and they, the devil, so it's quoting that passage of Legion begging Jesus to not send them to the deep, literally the abyss. And it says, it concludes by saying, do we not plainly see that the abyss signifies that part of the unseen world in which the lost dead dwell? And that the very devils, the demons themselves, were terrified at the thoughts of going there. Or they would not have entreated Jesus to permit them to pass into the swine. That the abyss here spoken of is to be the abode for some time, at least of the devils, is quite clear from the book of Revelation. And that's from a book called The Scriptural Doctrine of Hades by George Bartle in 1869. And isn't it amazing, again, that these 19th century and 18th century commentaries, the church fully understood Fallen angels, demons, the abyss, right? We need to, that's the purpose also of Thursday in theology, that we need to understand who God tells us are our real enemies in Ephesians 6, right? The, the, the spirit realm, not a person, right? The principalities, the powers, spiritual wickedness, and understanding the full counsel of scripture, that the Bible is a supernatural book about supernatural beings in a supernatural conflict that we are in the middle of. So, but notice it says the book of Revelation, and so I'll, I'll, I'll finish the question by saying that it references the book of Revelation because in Revelation chapter 9, the abyss is open. The bottomless pit is opened, and the, those same angels imprisoned are then released. And so, um, but what happens from there is all for another episode. So I will wrap up question number three with that. Awesome question tonight. And um, great uh, comments as well. And we are going to, I'm going to make sure without delay, I have a couple of announcements to make. The first announcement is, I want to say a shout out to everyone who's watching, trying trying to watch on Instagram. This is supposed to be my first connection to getting Instagram on my platform live. It's showing it as being live, uh, but I know it's not showing up alive on actual the Instagram app. So Lord willing, I will have that all worked out, but I know some of you come over from Instagram to watch it on YouTube or Facebook, so thank you for your patience. I greatly appreciate it, and hopefully, Lord willing, again, we'll be firing on all cylinders and also looking to get on Rumble as well, and I definitely want to get to our winners. So we have uh, three winners for tonight, and what are you going to win? So we already mentioned a couple of things. So um, you're going to win a copy, whether you want the digital or DVD copy of my new documentary, End Times Nephilim Deception. And like I said, I'll debut the trailer next week. It's a, kind of a soft launch, um, but it is available. So, I'm a, but next week will be will be full full bore trailer. It'll be up on everything and things for everyone to check it out. Um, but you'll win it now. You can win it right now. So you'll win a copy of my newest uh, documentary. And again, you can get that either if you, whether you want it in digital form for free or you want a DVD. Either is fine. And also, we got some merch. We have our shirt, our newest shirt, our Ask Me About the Nephilim shirt. And this is a great shirt for a great conversation starter. And on the back, it has a QR code that you can actually scan and we'll take you to a primer video that I did, two minute beginner intro to the Nephilim, intro to Genesis 6 video that I can take anyone to. I wore it, I've worn it out many times, but the first time I wore it, I had lots of people in Target scanning my back and it's awesome, right? So it gets, you wanna get a good conversation started and share God's word. Um, it's a great way to do it, so you'll win that. And, um, all right, and let's get to our let's get to our winners. So I think we have our winners selected. So our first winner is Jay Clark. Congratulations! Hopefully you're still here. <laughs> um, and also, if you, to collect your prize, just DM me on any platform. DM me or email me, whether it's on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, uh, Twitter. All my all the links are in the description of this video, and you can collect your prize. And again, let me know how you want the the, the film. Whether you want it in DVD, we'll ship it to you, of course, for free or we'll send you a link so you can download a free digital copy. Our second winner is BJ Jacobs Meyer. BJ Jacobs Meyer, congratulations, you have won. You are winner number two. 
So make sure you uh, reach out to me and collect your prize. And our third winner is uh, DS Nintendo, or should that be Nintendo DS? But DS Nintendo, you are our third winner. So congrats to all our winners. Um, and again, just feel free to contact me any way you want to, and you can receive your prizes. So we're going to wrap up tonight. The show is running long, um, but I appreciate everybody. And again, if you have questions, please, and you're watching this on replay, please put it in the comments. Let me know your thoughts on my answers. But if you have other questions for future shows, especially for next week, I'm already looking for questions for next week. Please drop it in the comments of the video. Um, Awesome program tonight. It's so great to be back with all of you. I had a great time. Season two, I think, is off to a great start. Let me know in the comments what you think of this episode. I'm, I'm looking forward to chatting as soon as we wrap up. And I will see you next Thursday.